I'm excited about celebrating Easter with you, the resurrection of Jesus, and there are so many symbols within the Christian faith, but none as significant as the cross. And when we talk about the cross, we're not talking about a, a piece of wood, we're talking about the complete, miraculous, perfect work of our salvation executed flawlessly in this man, Jesus, in his life, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. The Romans had made the cross and the symbol of the cross literally a symbol of, of terror, of horror. And yet God has made now that symbol a symbol of hope and of love throughout the whole world. Hallelujah, man. I got to get it together. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. What was a symbol of one of the most hideous, horrific deaths that could be executed is now again a symbol and represents one of the greatest events in all, and I'm not using hyperbole here, the cross, the life of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus is one of the most historical events in all of human history. And so we don't celebrate something lightly here today with our brothers and sisters throughout the entire world. One third of the world's population believes and has confessed Jesus as Lord, hallelujah. This is a big deal, a big deal. All of time is measured by the cross. All of time is measured by the cross, B.C. before Christ and A.D. after Christ. And listen, all of eternity is measured by the cross. Whether you accept it and are forgiven and cleansed and washed of all of your sins and spend an eternity now in the presence of the Lord and his goodness, or you reject it being the only sin, one sin that wasn't covered on the cross is the rejection of the cross because it was at the cross that all your sins were dealt with. It was at the cross that all your sins were atoned for. It was at the cross that God made a way for us to spend eternity blessed in his presence. And if you reject the one way, the one thing that made salvation available, then there's a different eternity that await, awaits humanity, and yet God loves us so much that he doesn't will that any perish, but that all come to the knowledge of the truth. God loves us, brothers and sisters, and he loves us so much. He has always, I want to make sure I say this because I'm so emotional, I just... I don't want to forget to say it, but God has always loved us, and he's always wanted to be with us. It's sin and our sins that separated us from God, but it was the cross that reconciled us back to God, and we will be forever ruling and reigning with Jesus because of the cross. Hallelujah. Look at 1 Corinthians with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and let's look at what Paul calls the power and wisdom of the cross. The power and wisdom of the cross. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Can you answer that here today? Am I the only one that sees the foolishness of the so-called wisdom of the world? Man, without God, we're crazy, brothers and sisters. Without God, we are insane. Without God, we are without hope. And whatever we call wisdom and the highest form of wisdom of man, it's foolishness in the eyes of God. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. 
For the Jews require or request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block, to the Greeks foolishness, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. The cross is the power of God, the message of the cross and what it embodies in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ is not only the power of God. And brothers and sisters, we have to mix faith with the cross in these last of the last days and all that power that has brought so much deliverance to our lives that we now only need to mix faith with it. And not only is it the power of God to deliver us from so much in this life, it's the wisdom of God. Think about that for a minute. The wisdom of God. Go over to the next chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at this statement about the wisdom of God. And years ago, this was one of the most arresting passages in the entire Bible in my pursuit of God early after I had an open vision of the cross. Those of you that have have heard me for very long know that in May of 1980, I had a supernatural encounter with the Lord and I had an open vision of the cross. And I saw the power of the cross instantly and the wisdom of the cross. And for over four decades now, I've been trying to communicate what I saw. I'm gonna get this right. It may take me time to get it out. But I'm telling you, there's more power than you've experienced in the cross and in the resurrection of Jesus that's available for you and I, and we're gonna hear about it, and we're gonna continue to mix faith with it, and we're gonna see our deliverance in every area of our lives as we pursue God with all of our hearts, amen? There's power, power to deliver you from so much. But there's also this wisdom, the wisdom of God the hidden mysteries of the cross. And I used to read the scriptures. I, I, I don't get to hear all of you like you get to hear me, but I hope that your experience has been progressive in you understanding God's love for you and that in one way you'll view the scriptures and then you'll get a revelation of the cross or the resurrection and it changes the whole picture, the whole picture of scripture, the whole picture of God's love for us. And this wisdom, I used to be confused over scriptures that talk about how there's hidden mysteries with God, that they're hidden and that they had been hidden. And from a lack of revelation of the cross for a season, I thought they were hidden from me, but then I discovered they were hidden for me, not from me. And it changed everything on how God deals even in the earth and, and with Satan himself. This is profound. Look at 1 Corinthians 2, verse 7. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Mysteries are divine secrets that are hidden in God. We speak this wisdom, but it's hidden, and it's hidden in a mystery which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Whatever mysteries he hid, they weren't from us as his people. They were for us. Amen? Amen. Hey, women. Amen. They were hidden for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Had God not hidden these mysteries from the devil and these fallen angels and principalities and powers... Had God not hidden the power of the resurrection, the power of your deliverance, the power of your freedom, the power of your forgiveness, the power of your relationship that would come through the cross, Satan would have never killed Jesus. But because it was hidden, he killed the Lord. And as Fernanda said today in a, a, a mini vision she had, I'm telling you, 
When the power of God from on high went into the bottom of hell itself and resurrected Jesus with the keys of hell and death, it tormented Satan. He actually probably did just scratch his face in agony. What have I done? And it's effect now on all my subjects that I had bound by sin and by death. They're all going to be set free now. Woo! Thank God the Father hid it from the devil, but now has made it manifest to us because it was all for, for our, our glory. You know, I, I didn't think I'd get emotional, so I'm, I'm almost trying to hurry. <laughs> and I did know I have so much in me that I can get, get off, but I, I hope that we're able to put up on the screen seven things that are near and dear to my heart that is the power of the resurrection. The death of Jesus was more than the death of an innocent man. Jesus was after something. He went after something, and I'm telling you, he got it, and it was you and me. It was you and me. He went after us to free us. It is for freedom, Galatians 5 verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has made us free. Maybe you're not experiencing the reality of all the freedom that's been provided, but I'm telling you, there's power there to set you free from multiple things as you mix faith with it. So I was hoping they would put that up for me so I could fly through it, but the first thing that you've been delivered from, for sure, is your sins, hallelujah. Amen. And I'm not talking about some of them. I'm not talking about most of them. I'm talking about all of them. You have been delivered from sin by the power of the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. Number two, and I need to hurry here because I get excited, you've been delivered from the law. Oh my gosh, I forgot where I'm at. I forgot where I'm at. Usually if I say that, it's dead silent. But I, I forgot where I'm at. You have a revelation of grace. You have a revelation that you weren't just delivered from your sins, you were delivered from performance-based Christianity. You were delivered from looking to your own works, your own holiness, your own ability, your own power. The power of the cross has delivered you from the law. Romans chapter seven says that we were in Adam and married to the law and the only way you can get out of a marriage is through death and because of the death of your old man, your old man died. Some of you need to realize your old man died. Now, I don't know what the women uh, think about that or what the men are going to confess, but your old man died, was crucified in Christ, and that death released you from that marriage to Adam and the law so you could be married to another, Jesus Christ and the grace of God. Hallelujah. You're delivered from all of those curses. It was a bad marriage. It was a bummer marriage. And yet many of you, you're, you're drawn to spouse abuse. You, you want to be condemned. You want to be beat. You want to be cursed. And God delivered you from the law so you could be married to another now. He delivered you from the world, from the the. The lust of the flesh, the, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And, and Paul says in Galatians 6, 14, I've been crucified, cross. I've been crucified to the world and the world to me. You don't have to be overcome by the world any longer. You don't have to be dominated by the world anymore. You don't have to be confused by the world anymore. There's power to straighten your head out. It takes power, supernatural power for some of you to change your mind and quit thinking like the world. But there's a power in the cross that delivers you from carnal thinking where you can see the power of God now in your life. We're delivered from death. We've been delivered from death in the resurrection of Jesus. And even if we lay these mortal bodies down, how many of you know the grave can't keep us down, hallelujah. That we will rise again. You know, I don't want to cry, but 
I want to do a shout out to my brother-in-law, Sue's sister. His wife died yesterday suddenly from a brain tumor. And I know he's heartbroken. And I know he's watching me probably live. And I just want to tell you, brother, we love you. And that Linda is with Jesus face to face. And she has no pain. She has no more tears. And, and you will see her again. I will see her again. Either the Lord will bring her back with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and all of the saints in heaven will be brought back to receive resurrected bodies. And if we're even still here, we're going to get a new body, a glorified body. And we, we, will, we shall forevermore be with the Lord and our family and our friends. Hallelujah. Thank God we've been delivered from death and the fear of death. That laying these bodies down is not death for us. We leave these bodies and go right into the presence of God. Amen. I've personally experienced that. I've died. Some of you don't know that. I keep finding people that don't know I died. But I died. And I'm telling you, the scriptures are true. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Why? You're born again spirit. Jesus said, if you believe on him and you receive him, you shall not come into condemnation. And you right now are passed from death unto life. Hallelujah. I was more alive out of my body than I am alive right now in my body. Amen. Amen. Why? The cross, hallelujah. And the power of the cross and what Jesus did for us at the, at the cross. We've overcome the, and been delivered from the powers of darkness. Colossians 1.13, God says, I delivered you from the power of darkness and, del and, and translated you into the kingdom of his dear of his dear son. We're, we're not delivered from the presence of darkness, but we are delivered from the power of it. Hallelujah. Amen. Why? The cross. The cross. One of the biggest deliverance you'll ever experience, mixing faith with it, is the deliverance of self. Your worst enemy really wasn't the devil. It was you. And now because of the cross, I can... I can follow Jesus, take up my cross. I can, I can identify with his cross because I was there. And now I can take up my cross, deny self, take up my cross and follow, and follow him. And then what I want to kind of just give an overview of is how we've been delivered from wrath. Go to, go to Romans chapter chapter 5. We've got Christians all over the world that aren't sure what they need to be excited about. Well, that's why I'm here. Well, I just don't have anything to be excited about. You're going to heaven, dude. You miss the devil's hell and you miss God's wrath. God's wrath has passed over your house. And that's what Easter is. We're celebrating Passover. We're going to be taking communion, the Lord, our Passover. And how that God's wrath has passed over us. And that we have been delivered from God's wrath. Romans chapter, chapter 5, uh, verse 8. Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrated his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God demonstrated, King James Bible says, God proved his love for us. He commands us in, in 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, to not love each other just with words and our tongue, but love in deed, actions, and in truth. God didn't love us just in words. He loved us in deed and in truth. He sent Jesus to die for us, to save us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Saved from what again? Saved from the wrath to come. Real quick, just look at 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, verse 10. 
1 Thessalonians 1.10. I'm going to have to go back to verse, verse 9. I, I apologize. It's not going to be on the screen. Well, verse 8 looks good. Uh. <laughs> Let's go back to Genesis, hallelujah, because <laughs> I want to keep it in context. Verse 9. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we have we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. All of us have turned from an idol of some type, kind, or form in coming to Jesus. And so you need to read things like that and realize he's talking to you. And then it says in verse 10, and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. Aren't you glad he was raised from the dead? Even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Jesus has delivered us from the wrath to come. There is wrath coming to this world in the day of the Lord, in the appearing of Jesus and his kingdom. There will be wrath and we have been delivered from that wrath that is still to come. And, and that should really do something on the inside of you. Because if you're a real person and an honest person, you know you deserved the wrath of God. You, you know you were a sinner before Christ came into your life and changed your life. And that you were on a path literally to a devil's hell and God's eternal judgment, God's eternal wrath. And it's like we lose sight of these things many times. And we should never lose sight of Jesus, our Passover. Amen. We should never lose sight of this beautiful salvation that God has provided. And again, how much he has loved us and has always loved us. Let me just quickly give a quick highlight of the original Passover meal. Because Jesus now is our Passover meal. And their Passover meal and the significance of being delivered from God's wrath should be something in our Passover meal, our communion, our what Jesus called the Lord's Supper or instituted the Lord's Supper. We should be remembering what we've been delivered from and saved from. If you're taking notes again, this is a highlight. I, I prayed about this all week, and where do I go? And I'm just glad I'm, I'm, I'm halfway through, maybe, and, and gonna make it, because I do get overwhelmed. It never gets old to me. I mean, I don't know how many thousands of messages I've preached, and it's just like the first time. And it needs to be that way for you fresh and new. Never forget what Jesus has done for you and our history and Passover history and the history of what we call communion goes all the way back to God's people in Egypt, a type of the world, and in bondage and slavery and Exodus chapter 11 verse 5 is, is where Moses speaks to Pharaoh and declares the 10th and final judgment, the 10th and final plague. I really personally believe the first nine was to bring everybody to repentance before the judgment of number 10 came and you could escape it. And Pharaoh is told that there will be a cry throughout Egypt that had never been heard before or we'll be after because Egypt had killed in Moses's generation, the baby boys drowning them in the, in the river. And they had technically kidnapped God's people. And both of those were a capital offense. And, and God said that the firstborn will die from the king and his throne, Pharaoh, all the way down to the animals, that judgment will come. 
and the firstborn will die. But to God's people, he says in Exodus chapter 12, verses five through 13, you are to take a lamb, a lamb without blemish within the first year, and you are to, to sacrifice that lamb. You're to shed the blood of the innocent so God could be merciful to the guilty. And you are to roast that lamb. You are to roast it. You're not to boil it. You're to roast all of it and eat all of it as a type of Christ. And the, the fire of God's wrath that he bore on the cross and the punishment for all of our sins. You roast it and you eat it with unleavened bread. Leaven was like it's yeast and it was a type of sin and how sin is productive in our lives. Anybody remember being a good sinner? About a tenth of you. Rest of you, I don't trust you. No, those of us that were good sinners, we know sin was progressive. It was like yeast. And you'd commit it, harden your heart, and now you're ready to commit something worse and harden your heart, and it just progressively takes you into the very pit and darkness of hell. And so you eat it with unleavened bread. You, you, you eat it with bitter herbs so that you remember the bondage. So you can remember every time you eat this, I, I want you to look at the unleavened bread. I want you to look at the lamb roasted by fire. I want you to eat it. I want you to remember its blood and how there is no remission of sin without blood and, and the bitter herbs. Don't forget what I, what I delivered you from. Eat it with your clothes on and take the blood and take a hyssop branch. A hyssop branch was common in that area in Egypt at that time. It was a weed that actually looked like a brush. It, it looked like a brush and they would take the hyssop branch and they would dip it in a basin of the blood from the lamb and they would put it on the, on the door, door post and the lintel. How many of you know you don't put it on the threshold? Nobody walks on the blood, hallelujah. Amen. But you're to put it on the lintel and you're to put it on the door post. And then, and then God says, it'll be a sign and I will pass over your house. And all that are in that house. And so that night, the angel of death came. And every house that had taken hyssop and applied the blood by faith, God says, I will accept the blood of the innocent, the blood of the lamb, and justify you and pass over your house now if you'll put faith in the lamb, if you'll put faith in the blood, if you'll act on it. Don't just talk about it, apply it. I'll pass over your house. And so blood became, and the shedding of the, of the blood of an innocent animal became ingrained in their minds of how we can have peace with God, of how a just, holy, righteous God can have fellowship with unrighteous man. And it gets so cool. I wish I could spend time, but Exodus chapter 25, verse eight, God says, I've got a good idea. This blood thing is working out so good. You're getting it. Build me a house. I want a house. Think about this for a minute. Again, in your immaturity, many times you look at the old covenant and, and, and you get this impression of God or, or these negative thoughts. And yet, through the cross now and the lens of the cross, I can look back now at God saying, build me a house. I love you so much. I want to dwell with you. I want to be among you. I want to be with you. Build me a house. And here's how we're going to work it out. We're going to get this blood thing going to a whole nother level and, and, and we're, going to, we're going to build it three parts. I'm going to tell Moses to make a copy of it so that it looks like on the earth, just like what's already in heaven. And I'm going to tell Moses, you build it into three parts. You've got the outer court, the holy uh, place, and then you've got the holy of holies. And God says, I got an idea. I'm going to live in the holy of holies. I'm going to be right in the middle of all of you because I just love you so much. I want to be with you. But we got this sin issue. We've got this sin problem. 
that you were sold out by your great, 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 great grandfather, <laughs> Adam, and, and, and now you've been born into sin. And, and sin has to be dealt with. And, and, and so I'm going to put this and institute this blood idea and the innocent dying for the guilty, me pouring my wrath out on the innocent so I could pour my mercy out on you. Uh, I'll live in the middle in the Holy of Holies. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant will be in there and inside that Ark will be the two tablets of the, of the Ten Commandments and the golden manna from heaven and Aaron's rod that buds, that's supernatural resurrection. And, and I'll put two cherubim angels guarding it, facing each other. But in the middle, there'll be this mercy seat. And here's the deal. Uh, you'll have all these sacrifices in the holy place that makes fellowship possible. But once a year, the high priest that stands on behalf of all of Israel, that has stones in his breastplate that represent every single tribe, every single person, he will be a representative, and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him come in there once a year, but not without blood, and he'll sprinkle the blood of an innocent lamb on the mercy seat, and that'll give you a whole year. I'll give you one year. Even your ignorant sins you didn't even know about, that blood will cover it, but it'll cover it for one year, and he'll have to come back the next year, and he'll have to come back the next year and the next year, and the next year. But it buys you one year. You get one year. <laughs> then all of a sudden, my t two favorite books in the Bible, Hebrews 9 and Hebrews 10, John recognizes him first and says in John 1, I think verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Doesn't cover it for a year, doesn't cover it for a day, the Lamb of God that will take the sins of the world away. And that Lamb became a priest, and not just a priest, but a high priest. And Hebrews chapter 9 talks about how that the high priest in the old covenant, in the old house, the house made with hands, could only go in there once a year, sprinkle the blood of an animal and get them one more year of the mercy of God. But this man, this high priest, this lamb, it would be his very blood and he would go into the house of God, the house not made with hands, the house in heaven, hallelujah, and he would not sprinkle the blood of a goat or a bull or a lamb. He would take his own blood and put it on the mercy seat and that blood didn't buy you a year. That blood bought you eternity, hallelujah. Eternity. And this high priest, this high priest sat down. No high priest in the old covenant and that temple made with hands ever sat down. But this man, because he offered himself and his blood for sins forever, once for all, set down expecting his enemies now to be made his footstool. Hallelujah. How many of you know the enemies of God and you are under your feet? Hallelujah. Where they belong and you need to learn to keep them there. Well, the devil's just on my back. What's he doing on your back? He's supposed to be under your feet. Amen. Go to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5. The church is dealing with a severe act of immorality. And they're celebrating it versus mourning over it. And a huge statement is made right in the middle of Paul invoking a type of church discipline. And he says in verse 7, Therefore purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you truly are unleavened. You are unleavened. Jesus has removed all your sin. Jesus has washed you in his blood. You have no sin. I'm not talking about your pieces of stupid that you do after the flesh. 
I'm talking about you in the presence of God, you in the mind of God, you seen through the eyes of the cross. I'm supposed to see God through the eyes of the cross, but the really, really good news is God sees me through the eyes of the cross. He sees me in Christ. He sees me as a new creation. He sees my born again spirit that is without sin. Saints, you, you, you have been called, you have been justified, you have been glorified and washed in the blood of Jesus. When or if you make a mistake, God doesn't remember that mistake anymore. God doesn't hold that mistake against you. God is merciful and, and he will remember your sins and iniquities no more. You've been washed a whole lot more than you've been thinking you've been washed. He says, we are unleavened. We in the mind of God are without sin. As God looks across the crowd now, he doesn't see your sin. He doesn't see your weakness. He doesn't see your flesh. He sees you in Jesus. Not just called, but justified. 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says, justified. The best definition I've ever heard of justified is just as, it, just as if I hadn't sinned. See, he doesn't even see you forgiven. Someone who sinned, who's been forgiven. He so forgave you and made you righteous with the very righteousness of Jesus, he sees you as if you've never sinned. Well, at least I'm getting some nods to God. Because, boy, if you could believe that, you'd be sipping this communion today. You'd be shouting and hollering. You'd be getting in the line another time. <laughs> You'd be getting in the line another time, I guarantee you, because you're justified and glorified. You're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now in the mind of God. Hallelujah. Thanks be unto God. Thanks be unto God. Unleavened bread, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sanctified and sacrificed here for us. Jesus was sacrificed for you, not for himself. Jesus didn't die for Jesus. Jesus died for you. And he died as you. You were there. And there's power. There's that power again of the reality of being forgiven that doesn't lose you to live unholy lives, but it just it, it breaks your heart and draws your heart closer to God. Even if you mess up. You're quick to fess up and to run to him now and not from him because of the power of your forgiveness. The power of your forgiveness. Go real quick to two Hebrews and then we're going to take communion together. Hebrews chapter, chapter 9. There are so many passages, passages in Hebrews 9 and in Hebrews 10. I can't encourage you enough to review them, to go over them. Because just like the seven things I just quoted in passing are a series in and of themselves, you can spend a, whole, a, a, a series of teaching, hours on your forgiveness, hours on being delivered from the law, hours on de being delivered from the world. How does that practically work out? Good church culture is walking out by faith our deliverance, hallelujah. Amen. Learning to take the hyssop branch of faith and apply the blood to the doorpost and the lintel of your heart, hallelujah, of your heart. And as you walk with the Lord and as you increase in your faith and the strength of it and the understanding of it, you begin to practically experience your deliverance more and more and more. And so Hebrews chapter 9 is the chapter that truly sets all of this up, comparing the old tabernacle to the new tabernacle of God now. And then Hebrews chapter 10 really seals the deal with how that all of those things in the old covenant were types and shadows. They were types and shadows of things to come and not the very image of those things. And that Jesus is the substance of all the types and shadows. Jesus 
was the lamb roasted at the cross. He didn't just die. He died a horrific, excruciating, painful death roasted by the fire of God's wrath against you. You know, I wish there were ways we had time and could even give you some practical applications, but surely everyone has experienced a friend that has done something very special for you and you knew you didn't deserve it. It actually humbled you, but it actually was a love from your friend that produced a greater love in you for your friend. No? I've just had so many people that have done things for me and it's like it just humbles you and then you see their love for you, their sacrifice and whatever they did and it actually makes you love them more. If we could really see by revelation what Jesus really died of and from and that Isaiah 53 says he he didn't even look like a man on the cross. He was so marred. He was so stricken and afflicted by God. It was the Father that placed your sins and my sins in his body on the tree. And it was the Father that poured out his wrath against you on the innocent lamb, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Don't ever let that not affect you. Don't ever let that not Draw something deep on the inside of you that makes you love and appreciate God. Even in the old covenant, again, looking at it so different than I looked at it as a boy, God saying, I just want to be with you so much. Do this, 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 and this. And by the way, I gave you this law and none of you can keep it. You think you can keep it, but I know you can't keep it. Uh, And it works my wrath But here's the deal. I'll set up the sacrifices so that when you realize you can't keep it, it'll drive you to the sacrifices and you'll put faith in the sacrifices like the first Passover meal. And and I will not only pass over your house and and that sacrifice negate my wrath, I'm going to bless you when you don't deserve it. And you're going to like it so much. You're going to be so excited about it. You're going to like me even more. And then I'm going to show you how much I love you, how much I want to be with you, how much I appreciate you, how much you're a part of my creation. uh, And you're going to see it. And then you're going to like me more. And finally, the substance come and we don't have all these rituals. We don't have all the shedding of the blood of animals anymore. And all of these symbols now have come to life in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, consummated at the cross. And and now you and I can see that, we can remember that, we can take communion and remember his body and remember his blood and, and, and we can love him because he first loved us. Because he first loved us. Chapter nine, let's just look at a couple of quick passages here in Hebrews. Look at look at Hebrews 9, 11. Because it's just talked about the natural tabernacle and things of that nature. But now look at verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of good things to come. That's the things you and I are living in right now. With the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, But with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all. How many of you know that includes you? Hallelujah. Once for all. Having obtained a temporary one-year insurance plan. (laughs) Amen. How many of you know Jesus didn't? didn't uh, provide a one-year temporary insurance plan. Let's look at it together. With his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained 
eternal redemption. Aren't you glad your redemption is eternal, not temporary? Man, there's so much. But go down to verse verse 21. Then likewise, uh, that's not a good spot to start. All right, verse 19. They won't have it on the screen, but you brought your Bible. I said you brought your Bible. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all of the people according to the law, he took the blood of, of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and what? Oh, here's hyssop again. You had to have the hyssop to apply the blood. How many of you know our hyssop is our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Hallelujah. With hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Aren't you glad we're not under the old covenant? I mean, what a day we'd be having. I'd be... (laughs) 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 Got to get you people right with God. (laughs) He sprinkled not only the book, but he sprinkled the all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood and without shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. How many of you know that there has been the shedding of the Lamb of God And thereby, and therefore, we have remission of all of our sins. He goes on to say in verse 23, well, I mean, there's nowhere to quit. That's going to be a series in and of itself. How many of you are happy, excited, and blessed that Jesus took away all your sins? Amen. Amen. If you're here today and you've not accepted God's love for you, you've not accepted the sacrifice He he gave His, His only begotten Son and said, if you would just believe in Him, believe in what He did on the cross, you will be saved. You will not perish, but you will be saved. God loves all of us with the same exact love. The issue is, Are we going to reject the cross and what he did for us and his love for us? Or are we going to accept the cross and his love for us? I want you to bow your heads here and there are many. There will be thousands that will watch. And you need to make a commitment. You need to decide, do you want the wrath of God to pass over your house? Do you want to be delivered from the wrath of God? Do you want to be saved from your sins? Jesus made a way for you to be saved. And if you'll just acknowledge your sin, but then confess him as Lord. If you'll believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that we're not just celebrating an event. We're not just celebrating a historical fact. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ who died for our sins and now has forgiven us and made us free. If you'll believe God raised him from the dead and confess him with your mouth, you too can be saved. I just want to ask before we pray over communion and take communion, if you're here and you don't know Jesus, you're not here by accident. You may think you were compelled or drug or brought here against your free will, but I'm telling you, this is your appointment. This is one more encounter with God saying, I love you. I want to live with you. I actually want to be inside of you through Christ. And if you'll believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and confess him as Lord, you will be saved. If that's you, I want to pray for you right where you sit. If you just slip up your hand and make sure I see it. Anybody in the room that hadn't done that, thank you. You can put your hand down over here. Awesome. Anybody else? Today's my day. I I, I know I need a Savior. I know I need to be forgiven. And today I'm accepting that forgiveness with the hyssop branch of faith. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. 
Those of you that are watching, you can pray with us as we pray for those that raise their hand here and make Jesus Lord of your life. Let's all pray together as we lead many into the kingdom of God today. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I come to you today. I confess that I'm not right, but I want to be right. I want to make things right. I can't do enough or quit enough to save myself. I need help. I believe Jesus Christ is that help. He is the Son of God. He came to this earth, lived a perfect life. He went to the cross and took my place. He bore my sins and my punishment for all my sins. He died, was buried. On the third day, He rose again. He is alive, and I confess Him as Lord, my Lord, my God, my King, that is soon coming. Thank you now for forgiving me and saving me. Help me now with all my heart serve you all the days of my life. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise God.